started. Um, I expect you both will have a link for the win, and you've also got it on Facebook Live. So um, thank you guys for being here for our conversation about downtown's future. We are very excited to be joined by Rebecca Flashiger, who is the executive director of the Little Downtown Partnership, and Mary Albers, who is the main partner of City Vision Associates. Um, the, the consulting group that is going to be working with Little Downtown Partnership on this once a decade strategic plan. Um, they're going to start off with a very brief presentation to kind of set up um, what, what's going on right now with the strategic planning process. Then we will open it up uh, for questions, comments, conversation. Um, I was lucky enough to attend a session that they did uh, a month or two ago. Uh, for downtown business owners over at, at the Slaughter Museum, and it was a really valuable conversation. It really was focused on, let's talk about what things we want to see for downtown. What, what are our goals for the next 10 years? What are the things that are important for us to, to focus on? So that's really kind of what we're going to do today. We are also streaming this live on Facebook, so I do expect that we will get some comments and questions from there as well. Um, she and I will be monitoring that, and we'll bring those questions and comments up as they, as they come up. Um, but at this point, I'm excited to turn this over to Rebecca and Barry. Yeah. All right, good afternoon. Thank you guys so much for having us. We're really excited about uh, what we're doing with the downtown strategy and the downtown, obviously, in, in general. Um, I'm going to start with kind of where we are, what we've been doing uh, for the last year or so. Barry's going to go more into the actual strategy itself. Um, we we want to take all comments that we can. Uh, just know that um, uh, I'm going to try to address what I think some of your comments might be. <laughs> so just to lay the groundwork, first of all, Global Downtown Partnership is made with two different entities. One is Downtown Development Corporation. That's really the strategic 20,000 foot view visionary. How do we make downtown want to feel good and attractive to businesses, to investors, to developers, uh, and tourists and residents, um, everybody, every user. And then the Global Downtown Management District, which is much more boots on the ground, making downtown uh, clean, safe, and beautiful. And we've got two different funding sources for each of those, a budget for each of those. So we put on one hat because really they do inform each other and you can't have an attractive downtown to investors and developers if it doesn't look good. Uh, the map that I want to show you guys is really important because when people talk about downtown, they mean a lot of different things. And I'm always asking you, what do you mean? Because it's not everything wants to 65. <laughs> Uh, the green shaded area is the management district. It is legally defined. It is um, very uh, purposefully uh, in this way because it is uh, assessments put on properties. Uh, nonprofits and governments don't pay taxes on properties. They're not accessible. So uh, some of the, where you see on the Western edge, you've got state owned properties uh, and that little hole where uh, Slutter, Slutter Field is up there, that's a, this one, this was actually drawn um, with, when it was drawn because in 1991, it was really hardy manufacturing industrial area. And then to the bottom right, that is the medical center, mostly nonprofit, which by the way, Luma is going to be addressing that area with its own um, entity that it's creating. The red line is more of what we generally consider downtown. I also think that that's a very gray area. It's just a little bit. We're going a little bit more to the west, at least to 12th Street. Um, it comes down Hancock, and I would say that Nula is really stretching the bounds east, but we're never going to go north into the river. Uh, and we may go a little bit south. We go to, to York um, on the opposite, just a block south of Farley. So, why is downtown so important? Uh, and I say this all the time, and sometimes you just have to kind of get into it. If you don't have a strong downtown, you don't have a strong city. Why is that? Well, in, in a downtown, and this is true, by the way, across the entire world for the most part. Uh, downtown is an area that has the most uh, visitors, the most attractions, the biggest job center, um, and it's where most of your tax revenues come from. And it does those tax revenues don't go just back to downtown. It helps pay for services across, across the entire county. And so that's why if you don't have a strong downtown, you don't have a strong city. Uh, you want to be able to uh, take care of the business and cultural and entertainment hubs um, because these are the these are the critical places that people come to. Uh, Five thousand residents currently. We hope to grow that. That's one of the things that I'm there we'll be talking about. But in this state, it's the third largest tax revenue producing area behind the cities of Louisville and Lexington, which I think is pretty incredible. 
So that's why we focus. That's why this office exists where I work. It is why we take on this 10 year plan because it is so important to not even just uh, Louisville, but the region. All right. So, what we're doing from Louisville Downtown Partnership's point of view going forward, we really want to increase the number of ambassadors. So, the ambassadors are who you see in orange shirts. Uh, their services are only in the management district, not all of downtown. That's really important, those two distinct areas I told you about. Um, we need more because we want to have more visible presence of people that are taking care of the space. You feel better when you're in a space that is obviously being taken care of. Colorful banners on the streets, flower pots being taken care of, clean sidewalks, power wash sidewalks, uh, green space. Uh, it's just really important uh, for your uh, uh, and you, I'm sure you notice when you're in any city, how do you feel when you're walking down the street? Are you supposed to be here? Or are you not supposed to be here? Do you feel safe when you're there or not? And that's what our ambassadors really help to do. Homeless outreach is something that we all know is an issue. We did not in my wheelhouse at all uh, officially, but it's something I deal with every day. I work with the city, I work with LMPD, I work with outreach agencies because it really is important that we are not only helping uh, homeless populations, but that we are helping the streets uh, be passable and attractive. Um, I do think there's going to be things that are that come in the next year that will be extremely helpful and um, beneficial for everybody. Improved infrastructure, green space, and trees. The mayor did put money in his budget and got passed by Metro Council that will improve these things. We're so excited about um, these street lights and the street can, uh, garbage cans, which may not be exciting to you, but it does change again. <laughs> how downtown looks and feels for you and how we use downtown. How can for young professionals, uh, something that we really want for renovation, redevelopment of great buildings. We're very lucky in the 60s and 70s when other cities were tearing down buildings, we didn't have enough money to do that. So we've got some great phones, uh, which means that we also are very, you know that where you are in Louisville, Kentucky, because they are unique, original buildings, especially like right where you guys are here on Main Street. Uh, there is no other block in the world that looks like that. We're very lucky for that. Those buildings are kind of perfect redevelopment uh, targets for, for housing. And if, what I really want to see is more 20, 30 something year olds living in downtown. To get vibrancy, you need people. Feet on the street. That's what creates it. So, how to make more people living there, especially since there aren't as many people downtown during the day. Uh, Hello to everybody on Facebook uh, because people are working remotely. It's just the, the way of the world. So we need more residential. Um, place making, beautification, and activation something that really, again, how to in, increase your desire to come and be a part of this, take pictures with it, put it on Instagram, um, but also to enhance your experience in that space. I think whatever we can do in the public realm to make um, an actual place. Beautiful and fun, but also that you can be with community and be with each other uh, in a unique space. Next. Thank you. Oh. So we're just going to run through a bunch of these. So these are the things that we have been, we started uh, last year through Park Wednesday. Every Wednesday, hopefully, you all have come. If you're on the fence about which days to come to the office, make it Wednesday because you've got really fun little atmosphere. We have music, picnic tables, and usually at least four um, food trucks. Uh, we ramp that up depending on uh, conventions in our town, but always a very kind of uh, festival atmosphere in the middle of the week, which would really provide some fun in that space. Um, last year and this year, two times we've done Cycle Via on Main Street, where we closed down last year Main Street for two miles. This last this year, it was a mile and a half. No cars, you can get right out in the middle of the road, ride your bike, skate, dance, whatever you want to do in the middle of the street. Uh, how do we engage with our streets and our public spaces in a different way that make it unique and fun? And also where you can be with each other. I've seen we've missed that over the last couple of years, how we can actually be together. Uh, it's easy to do your work from home, but we also need human beings and human social interaction. Bear Urban Sports Park, hopefully you've seen this. It's right across the street over here. Uh, the old museum plaza site. This is a redevelopment site. It will be something else. This is not permanent in any way. However, in the meantime, if you're going to have an empty lot in the middle of a really beautiful uh, historic block, why not make it something fun? So we actually painted a uh, pickleball field and two pickleball courts on here, and we hold leaves twice a year. We're about to announce the fall leaves, so if any of your offices or people want to 
fun out to play, you should do it. It's a lot of fun. And when you're in the space, um, and I don't know who trains for whipple ball, but I'm on Goofy because it's just a funny sport. It's, it's really special and unique. Uh, and we actually have Sports Park Social that goes along with it, which is really just a big, big truck and a beer uh, vendor to make it even more fun. I think I would like to point out that um, the LPA team did win the spring pickleball tournament. So uh, we also had to make it in last, so we're focusing on the tournament. It all evens out, right? Congrats. Uh, South Florida Night Market. This is something we uh, started last fall. Um, we didn't. It didn't really get going until this year. So we did it October, November, um, and we picked back off in April. It is closing a different block of portion. So this is between Guthrie and Chestnut. Again, for the purposes of experiencing your downtown in a fun, unique, different way. So you shop from local vendors. Uh, we're really uh, changing the way our musicians now. So this will be a really a draw for. Uh, bands that we're going to be having, uh, in addition to the vendors that you can shop from, but always food trucks and always a pop up bar. How do you have a fun time uh, in the middle of downtown? This is the second Thursday of the month, so July 13th will be the next one. Uh, sports Park Social, this is again using uh, the Bear River Sports Park for open play. So you can come and you can come and play on your own. You can uh, have some uh, beer or water or whatever you want and some food and just enjoy again uh, being, being fun and having a happy hour. You can also do it with your teammates or your workmates or any uh, organization building exercise. It's just a very, um, we're just trying to utilize it until it becomes something where you can. <laughs> and then uh, Alley Allen Street Gallery. So on the left, you see the doors. On the right, that is an electrical signal box. Um, making them pretty. So they're normally just black or gray metal, uh, not attractive. How do we create more chances and opportunities for, for whimsy? Walking through downtown and just being surprised by color and making something beautiful. So those doors are usually in a parking garage or an alley or an underutilized, maybe a utility door, maybe a side door. And then those uh, boxes, those utility uh, signal boxes are on every single corner. It holds the guts for the street lights overhead. And can we please make them pretty because we have to have them, but they're not always that pretty. And then lastly, uh, our brand new event, Downtown Drive-In. So we had a our first one three weeks ago. Our next one is Friday night, this Friday. Uh, we are showing movies at Brown Corner Amphitheater at Waterfront Park. Pull up at uh, some chairs or a blanket. We will have food. We have a beer. We have... Uh, lemonade stand. We're going to have a popcorn, Robbie's popcorn at this next one. How do we create those um, activities and events that are fun for you to come to with family, with friends, but that let you experience downtown in a different way? And I wish I put a picture in here. We got some drone shots at the last one. I mean, you're on the river, you're looking out, you see the sunset. It's really gorgeous. I hope you guys come to one. Um, all of the dates for all of these events, by the way, on the website. Um, okay, so in closing, because I'm going really fast, because Barry really has the, the important depth of this. Um, you know, how we focus our work and what we want to do, because there's so, there is so much to do. Downtown is important to so many different people in so many different ways. Uh, and to have a fun, exciting, vibrant downtown, you really do need the diversity and the density of people and uses. So how do we uh, make a lot of people happy is really, really what we're trying to figure out. Um, so helping our downtown infrastructure, just getting the basics right, right? So that there's just been a lack of investment, I mean, over decades, since it's been, uh, it's easy to take something for granted when it's always there and people are still coming in tourism, but it became more clear during COVID when not as many people were around. In fact, homeless sidewalks like the don't work. I really hate to point it out, it's depressing. We just, there's a lot of love and care that we still need to put in our downtown. Uh, those activations, those um, activities, events that I talked about, more of those that will bring us together because I miss people being together. Um, how do we help our homeless? Uh, and how do we help um, uh, either facilities and or the services? So we, we need both and we need more people in those services to help. And then tools for uh, encouraging that redevelopment, which could be in the way of incentives, it could be in the way of cash grants. I mean, there are many different ways we can look at that. Um, all of these things will be something considered in the downtown strategy, um, but 
every day that I'm working, these are things that we're working on too. Those are important to me and to our organization. And I think that's it for me. Um, I really want to go ahead and take a chance to uh, introduce Barry Alberts, who is our uh, leading consultant for, for this downtown strategy. Uh, he actually used to be the executive director of downtown development corporation. So I know he knows what he's talking about. He also had doing development in a lot of other cities. So to be able to get uh, homegrown experience and also see what's happening in other cities, I think really it moves to our benefit. Um, so I'm really happy to introduce Barry Hunters. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Good morning, or I guess it's afternoon now. So uh, I'm going to just give you a little bit of uh, perspective on sort of why why we're doing the downtown plan now, why it's important, but it's critically important, and then uh, uh, tell you where we've been, uh, and then open it up for, for questions and discussion, just like we've been doing with uh, I think we've had sixty something meetings about about the plan. So as Rebecca said, uh, we do a downtown plan every ten years. Or so we did one of them, as you said, 1990, 2002, 2013. Uh, things take a long time to develop in downtown. It takes a while to see see the impacts. So a ten-year time frame generally works pretty well for any any strategy for downtown. It's a particularly critical time that we do this uh, right now in downtown. Little bit. first, there's a new mayor in town. Next, next slide, and you know the mayor. Uh, uh, and this is important for lots of reasons. Uh, uh, his perspective is four years, eight years, 12 years. Uh, I worked with Barry Everson, who was 20 years, <laughs> uh, which is a little unusual, but uh, being able to develop a blueprint, a blueprint, a strategy for downtown, uh, you know, it's hard to do that if somebody, the city administration is on its way out or, or sort of finishing up. Uh, so the timing works out really well for, for uh, Craig being there. He's a development oriented guy. Um, so all that is, is a good opportunity for downtown. It's also next, as we all know, a challenging time for downtowns because of the impact of the uh, pandemic and the, in our case, uh, some lingering effects of the Rihanna Taylor situation that has created, as we all know, substantial challenges for downtowns, downtown Louisville, downtowns all across the country are so struggling with what is temporary, what is permanent, how are downtowns going to uh, uh, react and adapt to that next. There's a lot of uh, a lot of theories about uh, what downtown is going to be like. Uh, nobody exactly knows, but we're uh, you know enough time has passed that we are beginning to see trends that are becoming more permanent, or at least things we can uh, plan around. The most obvious being that uh, uh, office workers are not going to return 100% back to downtown. Uh, they are coming back to some extent, but we have to look at downtowns not as a uh, primarily a central business district with some residential, some cultural, some civic. That, that all of those things are now equally important to residential. Uh, I mean, to office development. And for for those of us who have been preaching for years, the fact that downtown really needs to be a fully fully mixed use neighborhood neighborhood in quotes. Uh, that we think is coming to pass. So it's a very uh, important time for lots of reasons to uh, to deal with uh, downtown Louisville in the long run or over the next 10 years. As, as uh, Rebecca said, there's a lot of short-term issues that have to be addressed. Otherwise, this, this is all talk. There's issues about perception of safety. There's issues of homelessness. There's issues of uh, incentivizing more residential, uh, the lack of office workers. Those are all things that Rebecca works, works on every day. And uh, we're, we're making progress. Um, so uh, thinking about a tenure time frame, sometimes it's hard because everybody's focused on what, what needs to be done now and what's what's missing now. But we're we're trying to balance the two between uh, the other things that Rebecca deals with, you know, every every hour of every day and spending time thinking about the longer term trends. That's what we're we're we've been balancing for the last six months and we'll continue to do so over the next six months. Now, one of the uh, interest, one of the few things, few good things that come out of the pandemic, <laughs> it's not a long list, is uh, that a lot of cities, not so much rural, but a lot of cities experiment with uh, different ways to activate their downtown, different ways to use the streets. Uh, a lot of those examples, again, are, are uh, things that have been turned into permanent uh, uh, reactions or permanent situations, particularly. 
taking back a lot of the infrastructure uh, that was devoted to automobiles. Uh, we and Louisville, as you all know, have very wide streets. We've got one-way streets that means traffic was very fast. Uh, did we need all of that capacity before the pandemic? Probably not. Uh, but clearly, after the pandemic, we know that we, we don't need that much infrastructure devoted solely to the pedestrian, I mean, solely to the automobile. And uh, the more we can begin to take back some of that public ground, and that is the, the public ground that we all own, uh, the better. And again, a lot of cities have uh, uh, done this either temporarily, uh, permanently, taking back the lane, closing the street, uh, uh, slowing traffic. Uh, all of those things that we, we need to do a better job of. Uh, now there's a uh, more interest number one, uh, and more example in other places about how you do that in a way that uh, makes sense. I think uh, you know some of the things Brandon that are happening like how the Bart Road uh, suggest that you know, you know the, the world in end will make some changes to Bart Stan Road and uh, it's to the better of that district and uh, we have the same opportunities down there. Next. Uh, one of the things that is uh, clearly uh, in everybody's mind is uh, residential, more residential development now, kind of more of a residential neighborhood. We'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, a lot of discussions about we have all these big office towers, uh, let's convert it to residential. Uh, easier said than done, uh, certainly on big, big, uh, major office towers. And, however, uh, there are a lot of uh, what we call Class B buildings, older buildings that probably were at the end of their lifetime anyway as office space that are more easily convertible. Uh, and we're looking at that. So, so there are opportunities, and, and we're certainly, as Rebecca said, looking for ways to incentivize more opportunities to, to get more people living downtown. Uh, we one question was, you know, what's what's the market or are we near capacity? We knew instinctively that we were not anywhere near capacity. Uh, we've engaged the, uh, the, the, the most credible uh, urban residential development uh, research firm in the country, Room with Bo. Uh, they've done a, an analysis for us, and it shows that over the next five years, we have plenty of, uh, plenty of demand, unmet demand, that uh, uh, we have the possibility to attract. In, if we can uh, provide housing downtown, that's a range of affordability, it's not all of the units are the same price, and a range of housing styles. Not everybody wants to live in a four story apartment building. You know, can we do more condos? Can we do more townhouses? Can we do more cottages on the edges? We're looking at all of those things to uh, encourage our, our positions. Anybody that wants to live down, we should have an opportunity uh, to provide it at their price point and their type of uh, housing style. That means there needs to be issues not to, it's fine, but we don't want to lose uh, anybody that says, I'd like to live downtown, but there's no place to live. Next. Uh, so, as Rebecca said, we, we've talked to uh, you know, lots and lots of people. Uh, I've been really impressed with uh, the uh, commitment of the stakeholders downtown, uh, uh, understanding there's a lot of challenges, but people are uh, still excited about the potential for downtown. They want to be part of it. Uh, as Christy said, we had just a lot of interest in uh, in uh, the, uh, the public sessions we'll have. And the first set of public sessions was just like this. We didn't have anything to propose. It was really what, what's important to you? What are the what are the principles we should be uh, uh, thinking about as we think about downtown local? And what are some of the things we should start focusing on? And uh, there was a you know a relatively wide range of ideas suggested through uh, again all of these meetings and the public meetings, but they, they, they seem to sort of be a consensus around four or five or six things that most people seem to think were important and provide direction for us as we continue to set over the next six or so months. Uh, the next slide. So so these so we had a, a number of public meetings uh, and next. So we've come to the point where uh, we sort of know uh, initially what, what we're focusing on. I, think, I, I mentioned most of these, I think, so far. One is uh, downtown is a residential neighborhood. And uh, it's written this way because it's not just more housing in. It's providing uh, people who are living downtown with a sense of neighborhood, the same type of amenities uh, and the comfort that they would if they live in any other neighborhood. So if you're if you're living in a residential building, 
And you know, you already own the building on that block or that two block you're in, and uh, you're living next to a convention center or a or whatever, that's fine. You know, we want to encourage that. But you know, is there a way to provide uh, a sense of community uh, with a number of people living in the, in the central area where there's a neighborhood park where you can take your dog out for a walk, where there's a neighborhood service that we all own the restaurants and bars downtown? Uh, but sometimes we want just a little cafe to go to uh, and sit and, and, and interact with your, with your neighbors. So providing that sense of neighborhood feel is important. And that's what things like you know, one-way streets and two-way streets and travel, you know, cars going 40 miles an hour, uh, street lights that are not working, those things all detract from a residential environment. Uh, that we talk about the streets being prioritized for pedestrians rather than uh, rather than cars, we all know. I think if you've been in downtown for a long time, that uh, a lot of the street system was laid out you know, 40 years ago with the uh, goal of you know, bringing, making it easy for people to come into downtown at nine o'clock, work in their office, and leave at five o'clock. And those of us who were there the rest of the day or the weekend for the nights are left with a system that really doesn't work anymore. Terms of that, so so reconnecting our streets with pedestrians is important. Uh, we have a very large downtown. Uh, it's uh, it's not homogeneous. There are a lot of districts that have their own identity, that have their own vitality. West Main Street, uh, uh, Nulu, Butchertown, those are vibrant areas. But there are areas, uh, other areas of downtown that are less less vibrant and have, have less of a connection to the rest of downtown. How do we put those? those areas uh, give them their own identity and make it easier for people to move from one one place to the other we have in terms of these discussions we've been having uh, a number of people say well you know uh, a lot of people don't come downtown because they're you know there's a perception of uh, safety problems or you know there's homeless encampments and uh, we'll say well you know where do you go and they say well we're going to do it it's like well news part of it well it is, but if you're not making that connection, then the fact that there's activity in one part of downtown doesn't help other parts of downtown. So making those connections within the downtown are important. Same is true for the neighborhoods. We have uh, we've all heard about the nice street divide, you know, that has for years served as a barrier between downtown, the activity in downtown, the activity in the, in the uh, West End. We're all told on the go in a tremendous revitalization now. Uh, how do we break that down as a barrier, make it more as, as a scene that's connecting the uh, parts of downtown and parts of the adjacent neighborhoods. Broadway serves the same purpose and doesn't serve the same purpose. Uh, it's also a, a barrier, pretty strong. The southern end of downtown 65 is, is a barrier. So we need to uh, reduce those barriers and make it more welcoming to move between downtown and, uh, and, and the surrounding neighbors, which have their own sense of value, right now. And, uh, and as again, going back to the district approach, you know. Uh, Having, as we said, having the fact that there's a lot of people in New Loop, where a lot of people go into the museums here. Uh, if you're on Fifth and, and Chestnut, you know, and there's not much happening there, um, the fact that one area of downtown is active doesn't really help that. One. So each district, uh, if we can create a stronger identity, anchors and activity generators in each district, and then move people from one district to the other, encourage people <laughs> to move. From one to the other, that's going to benefit everyone. So, those are the early priority areas that we're working on. All those are some other things, obviously, we're working on, but uh, we want to make sure that we are addressing issues that uh, have been long standing issues in the local life and one way system, issues that have arisen because of the, the new downtown paradigms uh, coming out of the uh, uh, results of the pandemic. and. Uh, Looking at some of the new opportunities that uh, we may have because of uh, changes in the way people think about things. I'll give you one example, then we'll open up the questions. Uh, so, the city, when we're talking about anchors and panelists, uh, we realized for a long time that the city has a lot of property that uh, it owns downtown and uh, is not necessarily either as productive as it once was or. Has never been particularly productive. So uh, we pointed out three areas the uh, area behind and around City Hall, Metro Hall, the old fiscal court building, a parking lot behind City Hall, police uh, 
and toward a building which is being demolished as the police move or the south. Uh, that's one concentration of, of uh, publicly owned land. Uh, the old museum plaza site, both the uh, infill site and um, uh, main right here, and the uh, the old site next to the old site next to the Ali Center. Uh, that's another um, set of properties the city owns. The uh, what the city calls the mud lot, which is a whole block uh, right on the 9th Street, 9th Street Devotion between Liberty and uh, Liberty and Market, Market Liberty and Jefferson, Jefferson Liberty. Uh, so. Uh, so the city and, and actually the proposals will be discussed further. They put those out for development proposals or the development team to come up with proposals to put those back into uh, into more productive use. And uh, they add each of those concentrations of uh, assembly of properties could become new anchors for uh, for those particular parts of them. So trying to activate spaces. There's been a lot of discussion about. Uh, we have a lot of surface parking lots that uh, may, maybe they were never needed, <laughs> maybe they're no longer needed, or so many of them. Uh, you know, a lot of them are private ownership or states. And there's real estate attorneys here, you know, that it's difficult to, to uh, get those activated oftentimes. But the city owns property that is not uh, as underutilized, at least part of that. So we're trying to uh, move some of those things along. and. Uh, so far, the uh, the new administration has been very receptive to things that even in the early stages have come out of uh, these initial discussions. So we're we're uh, we know there are a lot of challenges in downtown, but uh, someone who's worked in downtown over you know hundred years, uh, uh, we know there's always challenges, and these may be a little bit stronger than in the past, but uh, there's still a lot of opportunities here, and we're we're excited to. Uh, we're excited to be part of it. And we're excited that there's so many people who still want to be part of it and want to see them flourish. So with that, we'll again we don't have we're not at the point yet where we have any specific proposals to uh, have people respond to. We just as I said, sort of completed a very extensive due diligence period to make sure we're thinking about the right things and we're addressing things that people who have a state in downtown want to see addressed. And now we're now we're getting in. I think Rebecca this morning at a meeting said we're starting to put meat on the bones. Uh, and hopefully by early fall, uh, we are we'll have some proposals to respond to. Uh, so oh, so one other thing. So uh, I'm sorry, there's always one other thing. So uh, as part of uh, this effort, we uh, are starting a series of what we call obviously the better name for but community conversation where issues that we're thinking about uh, and talking to other people across the country, uh, we thought, well, let's let's open up those discussions so that everybody can hear what we're, what we're thinking about. So we're gonna have four or five uh, of these virtual conversations. The first one is uh, it's on the website, uh, yeah. uh, July the 19th, uh, about sort of what, what, what's happening in post-pandemic, what are cities, uh, Thinking about what they're trying to do, we've got a really good panel set up. Um, uh, it's about an hour and a half discussion. So, uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, and we'll have a number of those, but the first one will be on July the 19th at 12. With that, comments, questions, input? Yes, sir. I have a question. Um, it looks like a pretty robust process for gathering input. I saw the one slide there with the two columns, probably 25 different groups were consulted. To me, the big omission, what I didn't see on the list, was a group directly representing employees, the workers. You might say, oh, well, the, you know, the company owners are, no, they don't. That's a different perspective. So, and it occurs to me that one of the big issues we're facing is Workers don't want to come back downtown. And this, frankly, anti car mood that has gripped Louisville for the last many years, um, that's bothersome to workers, right? We have streets that are perpetually in need of repair, right? Uh, we have traffic lights that aren't time. We've got this, oh, let's repurpose streets. And, you know, uh, it's just anti car. And you guys need to think about that. And there are probably a whole host of other things. Uh, I can say when I work downtown, 
Um, there were issues with, you know, these events that start at four o'clock officially. Guess what? The bands are out there doing sound checks and tune-ups hours before. And, you know, here we are the economic engine of the state, and I can't have a telephone conversation with a client because it's so darn loud. What, I'm supposed to plan my business around these events, and frankly, I'm not keeping track of them. So, you know, that surprised me. Uh, so, I mean, just think about things like that as well. Maybe the start time isn't 4 o'clock, maybe it's 5 or 5.30. I don't know. But not for me to figure out, but, you know, and I can tell you really once I appreciate you for that. You want to respond to that? So I don't, uh, cars will always be here. I don't think we're anti-car in general. I do think what we're trying to figure out is, are there ways that we can experience our downtown in a different way? So the, where we do close block off, A, they're not hyper-utilized streets. So food truck Wednesday, is it one block of 4th Street between Dark City Market? It does not see a lot of activity. There aren't even parking meters in the block. Um, that's that's a weekly event, and that really is meant to be uh, more of a fun come and get your lunch and enjoy being outside with people. The the night market, which I think you're referring to, that starts at four, also a half a block, and it also is a very underutilized block on the other side of 4th Street Live. Uh, people are not using it to get out of downtown and end up in 4th Street Live. Um, I do think that there just has to be a balance of how we look at how we use our streets in downtown. The streets have been so big and we're for car, 100% for cars for so long. I think what you're hearing, and I'm sorry that we mischaracterized it as anti-car, is how can pedestrians also benefit from how we look at our streets today? But yes, I'm yeah. I would, uh, I, I would agree, agree with that. I was going to add, I've seen what's been pushed back about being anti-car. I think, I think, uh, uh, we, we we haven't done a good job of uh, accommodating and integrating people in cars, people on the street, people who live downtown, people who are biking down. I think on any given street, on any given day, or any given time of the day, it's prioritized for one of those groups to the exclusion of the or the discredit of the others. And I think that's a, uh, I probably shouldn't say this because we're being taken, but I think that's a, uh, <laughs> a, uh, uh, an outgrowth of uh, the way that the, the, the sort of silos that the city city administration in the past, uh, I've been part of it, so I uh, have dealt so like the streets are public works, you know, and the sidewalks are, you know, the management is the thing, and the parks are something else. And I think we need, we, we just had this discussion this morning, we need to think about our public realm, the sidewalks and the streets, in a way that is welcoming and accommodating and flexible to a bunch of different people, uh, the different the way people use it. So we we talk to you know bicyclists and they say, you know, this is this is horrible, you know, you know, it's it's unsafe and it's, it's not it's not friendly. The bike lanes start, the bike lanes in. We talk to people who are driving and they say, uh, you know, one street is one way, and then we get to a certain block and it's two way, and it's one way in, and it's hard to it's hard to get around. So I think our challenge is uh, to try to better accommodate in, in a vibrant mixed use district, uh, the fact that there are going to be people in cars, there are going to be people on the street, there are going to be people in bikes, there are going to be people in wheel, wheelchairs. You know, there's there are ways to make downtown uh, welcoming, and there are ways to make it seem like a hostile one. And we have places that are more welcoming than others, and places that are more hostile. And and our goal is to try to accommodate. This. It's not. It's not easy. At any, at any given day or given time, someone's going to be frustrated. But over the course of, uh, of, of uh, you know the the, uh, the the daily activities of downtown, uh, we need to be accommodating to more people than than we're frustrated. Uh, that's a low bar, maybe, but it's, we need to start. Sort of a question comment. Um, it, I'm very interested to see when you guys come out with more concrete plans, how you tackle and think about sort of the scheduling or the time for all of the various pieces of the puzzle that you're putting together here. Because 
you know, some of these are, you know, low hanging fruit, just do it now, sorts of things like infrastructure, painting those, you know, electrical boxes and things. Um, some of these hinge upon one another, like making improvements to the streets, raise them down and activate different catalyst centers or various neighborhoods and such. Um, I guess more of a comment is I, I would just hope that you guys consider carefully how you are investing in achieving those goals for the various timelines that are meeting like two years, five years, seven years, ten years. Uh, and then the question I had, um, this is just a little anecdote, uh, my wife and I are always looking for things to do during the week. Uh, you know, sometimes we have our kids with us, sometimes we have like a day at night. Uh, I didn't frankly even know about the night market or the drive-in, um, you know, movie uh, showings, but if there was a city run website um, where people could aggregate, um, you know, things that are happening, maybe this already exists. I don't know about it. Globaldowntown.org. We have events that uh, scrape every week from everywhere, every single venue and attraction. It's a little overwhelming. We do actually send out a weekly email blast. Sign up for that. We'll tell you what's going on just for the next week. Uh, in the day of social media, it's really hard to get the word out to everybody because we're everywhere but nowhere together. So we, we try our best to advertise, but our website is chock full of information. Okay. Happy day night. Yeah, so I mean, I'll I'll go check that out. Yeah, I understand it's hard to get the word out there, but I guess I really encourage you to try harder for young professionals to write it out. Um, so if you can get the word out, I bet you'll get more people. Thank you. Can I address your first comment? Yeah, because I think it's it, it is an interesting comment. Something that we struggled with a lot. So, so uh, you know, uh, city city government, you know. It, it, a change takes a long time, particularly if you're talking about making changes to streets or to parking or to bike lanes or whatever. You know, that you know, you have to go through, you know, you have to find funding, you have to uh, go through, uh, you know, an RFP process to find designers. And a lot of the streets and the space of downtown are state roads, you gotta go through the state. It's just a, it just takes forever, and uh, sometimes. That's used as an excuse, you know. Well, we'd like to do that, but you know, we've got to go through ten thousand, uh, and uh, uh, but, but people are doing their job, uh, so I don't want to demean that. Uh, one of the things that, that happened during the pandemic uh, in a lot of places was they said uh, we need to do something quick, you know. So let's try something on a pilot basis. You know? We'll close this street, or we'll take some parking space with that. And you know, a lot of a lot of cities did some really interesting things in terms of outdoor dining. How we use the sidewalks, how we use the space, you know, the parking spaces. Uh, we didn't do much of that. But uh, there are, it's, it's given uh, for most of us in the, in the downtown business uh, to the new hope that you know, yeah, sometimes, sometimes before you make these major changes, you try it out. You know, you put some traffic on out, you can close a lane you know, or you do something. And uh, I think that the new administration is more amenable to that. So uh, we, we were just talking about this morning. We were talking about one street that might, might uh, ultimately should go to two way. Uh, but in the meantime, can you, you know, uh, you know narrow it down a little bit, get some more pedestrian uh, improvements out on a pilot basis to see if it works. And so I think there's more chances of getting some things done quicker, even if the ultimate solution is five or seven years down the road. Any questions on the um, historically speaking, you know, you've had like different iterations of the downtown development plan. Um, through your review of older plans, how much have you seen from an older set of plans carried into new ones? And do you anticipate that for this uh, upcoming plan? Or is it going to be completely different? Well, I think uh, uh, I think it's always a continuum. So, you know, in any, any, any business, uh, you know, that does a 10 year plan, you know that. Five or seven years from now, there's going to be different conditions. You know, things change, and we want to and we want to start working in a way that's going to be flexible and accommodate those changing conditions. 
uh, but still be true to the principles of the mission. So I think what well, I'm mean, I don't know if I because I work on a bunch of these other things, but I think we've been pretty uh, with a couple of exceptions, pretty true to staying on mission uh, as we go from one decade to the next. Uh, you know, things become more important. You know, if you go back to the 1990s, times, you talk about more residential development, and there has been more. There's certainly been more since then, and uh, but, but we're not there yet. And maybe looking at residential in a more neighborhood approach as opposed to just individual building is a nuance that will change. So these things do do uh, hopefully all relate to each other. The last plan in 2013 was more uh, sort of landscape physical oriented than development oriented. I think we're certainly because of the pandemic, we're more focused now on uh, uh, in more investment, more development, more activity generation, in addition to Making the streets nicer and you know those kinds of things. So I think there is a continuum. I don't think we're going to veer completely differently than where we were before, but we have more. I think we have more opportunities now to uh, uh, be a little bit bolder in some of those things that maybe were touched upon in the past, but now seem more more critical than maybe ten years ago. You want to respond to that? Yeah. Love what a downtown public works plan that's made up of here's the 15th street road project that we know we need to sort of optimize the grid to make things work. Because I ask that because my experience is that I think you need something like that to actually get involved up. Like public works is a three year paving plan that every year they know the pavings in this year to do the budget that they do it. They do it and that keeps people on track down schedule. This is kind of what's coming. And in terms of you know road guides, whether it's uh, just guiding them or doing them from one way to two way, and they don't have to be both. I mean, this is in Portland, Oregon. They have really nice, neat, tight one way street. This time we got awesome to make their one way this time. Um, but some of the other, not just one way, two way, but the circularity problems that we think about on the east side, where like Liberty and Chestnut and King you know, sort of weird and curvy, and it forces you like all those things are where you can't go south or there's Phoenix House apartment, like or a whole straight line, yeah, you know, before this one. Oh, call that stuff up. Was, anyway, all those different projects that are circularity problems. Do you have them all identified and like planned out and budgeted out and then? Put in some sort of plan where they can be phased in with public works with every other. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great concept. Yeah, and, and it's a great comment. And the answer is sort of no. <laughs> uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we certainly spend a lot of time talking to public works ones. And uh, they, they generally have a number of plans in plus. I'll use the one way to two way. So, you know, they do have a a plan for converting one way streets to two way streets. Uh, the plan has been in effect since you know 2002, you know, and maybe two out of 20 have been done. <laughs> so, so what good is that? You know, uh, and I don't mean that. I mean they have a lot of things on their plate. So I'm not. So it's good that there's a plan. But these things, these things tend to you know whether it's public works or parks. Uh, replacing street trees or whatever, there, you know, oftentimes there is something on paper that says, yeah, we need to do that, you know, but it just kind of sits there, it gets lowered in, in the priorities. I think well, one of the things we're trying to do in this effort is to uh, basically, instead of looking at things in silos, so this is a street here, and this is a uh, roadway change here, look at, look at the vitality of our streets in these districts, and then figure out, well, figure out what what the proper sequence is that's the most critical thing to do now and then focus you know as opposed to saying well we're going to start yeah you know, i'll use one example where uh that makes it specific there is a uh a plan to uh, uh convert street from one way to two way and uh the sequencing is we're going to do at least the downtown to start then we're going to do west of downtown and then we'll come back and do a section of it and, and our response is this is the most important thing. Right? Why, why do that? And it's because, well, it's easy to figure out that way. So, yes, yeah, so one of the results of this will be an implementation program that hopefully is 
integrated in terms of where where there are resources that the city has and needs to uh, needs to uh, advance these things and uh, what the proper uh, what the what the most critical things are for you know, short term and term. Yeah, it's a good. It's a, it's I, a really I was just encouraging you. I just wanted to do things up there. I'm curious, how do the districts to propose like a five year have a chance to adopt like five year downtown yeah. street plan or something? So yeah, that would be yeah. No, it's a better. I, I go back to, to this gentleman's comment about uh, you know often house oh yeah we have a plan for that you know you know it's on the books. Uh, but if it's just been sitting there for 10 years, then it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really help anybody. Chris, oh, you go ahead. Sorry, I just, not a question, so much as a comment. Um, I work for uh, Churchill Down Reopening, our game, so to be down here in, down in a few months. I've been in the gaming industry, in the gaming space for 20 years now. And about 10 years ago, the big players in my industry, decided to move their businesses or, or expand off the strip. So you started to see casinos pop up off outside of Vegas and outside of um, AC. And um, enter gaming enterprises moved to the regional model. And as such, I've opened a few um, casinos in downtown districts and in urban areas in recent years. And I think you guys do a fantastic job compared to the other cities that I've worked in, and just keeping that downtown spirit alive and, and keeping the city focused on downtown. There are several cities across this country that do not do that. I've opened a billion dollar casino in Massachusetts in a small city that did not have a whole lot of, it had similar challenges to, to Louisville and that city, doesn't have this kind of an organization doing this kind of grassroots uh, work um, to to make the city more attractive. And as such, that product is to this day is still struggling. So my my former employers are still struggling to make that property profitable because the surrounding, you know, the, the city around it doesn't support the business entirely. Uh, I don't think the answer to the car situation downtown is more cars. I think it's less cars. I think the answer is creating ways for people to transit to downtown easier, quicker. So I don't have to drive my car downtown. I may drive my car to a point, jump on a train, jump on a tram, and 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 get. That is the answer. There's. I learned last year. There's 300 plus parking facilities in the in Louisville. That's way too much. Uh, with that. Yes, it is a easy way for you to monetize the land that you own downtown, but it does not help the downtown mechanism, the downtown ecosystem to just add more parking. The, the answer is to create ways for people to get to downtown and get around downtown easier. Um, I, I I see you on the news all the time. I see uh, I see uh, the work that. LDP does to, to, to breathe life into the city and things like that. That's all I gotta say. Thank you. So, so uh, and I agree that, that Rebecca kind of great job in terms of uh, you know energizing all the things you said about uh, about being in the downtown and uh, uh, having activity generators. So you guys are a perfect example. So so when you talk about this is I'm gonna sort of turn it back to you, but you know, so you know uh, Gaming facilities, particularly, you know, when they're out in when they're not in downtown, when they're out sort of in, in the region or by themselves, tend to be, my understanding, I'm not a big gambler, but we sort of looked at these things in the past, tend to be internally oriented. You know, you come to the facility and there's a hotel, there's restaurants, there's, you, know, you, you want people there you know, with playing the machines you know, as much as possible. There's not much external impact you know, in the downtown. You have the ability to have that. That's right. That's right. How, how do you, again, we should sit down and talk about this. You know, how can we help you uh, not just attract people to the facility, but then get them uh, either before or afterwards to enjoy the rest of them? Right. Well, we, we, we've had a few conversations before yeah. with, with, with LDP. We've been partnering with Global Tourism um, mostly because, like you said, 
when we have a property of in the suburbs, for example, like there's a marketing store, there's a marketing mechanism that helps us get pe get people in, in the door, right? Um, when we when we do things in a, in a in a downtown area like we're doing in Louisville, it's it's not intended. It's not for the locals. It's we're going to be focused on attracting any one of the folks who are staying in one, any one of the eight thousand hotel rooms within a fifteen minute walk yeah. or fifteen minute drive uh, to our facilities downtown. So so the so the the. The strategy is different. Whereas, you know, when we're in the suburbs, we are we have direct mail programs that we incentivize people who live in 20, 20 mile radius to come to our building. For now, when we when we do things in an urban setting, it's different. It, the marketing is different. We are partnering with tourist board, we're partnering with convention, convention groups and commission planners. Um, so yeah, that's how different, that's how the two different models work. Well, it's great you guys are making that investment down. Very well, I appreciate it. September? Are you still opening in September? Late October to so Halloween weekend. Oh, my God. <laughs> sure. I'm uh, from Louisville. Louisville could be as a Yamba city. Oh, what? A Yamba city. Every time an idea comes up, yeah, but, and there's an excuse. And sometimes that excuse is red tape. You're the third largest economic engine in the state. It might be time to flex that economic power in Frankfurt and downtown to where, okay, we don't want to have to go through this prolonged process to get the end result that we all know we should have. Let's consolidate it or let's streamline. The other thing I'll tell you is. There's an old adage, you can tell the health of the city by how many cranes are there. Go look at downtown rural, the whole area, and see how many cranes are there. You're lucky if you see one. I go quite often to Dublin, Ireland. Same city, same size, same kind of structure, if you will. Big river runs through it, not on the edge of it. 29. In there. Perfect example. Insurance company has the largest building there. It's only 14 stories high. Sat empty. The city came in and said, do something with it or lose it. They're tearing it down and building a hotel. That's the kind of authority you have to have. The city said, we're having way too many cars coming in downtown. How do we solve this? So they put in the Lewis line. So well on the old uh, subway above ground, if you will. Packed with seven euro a day for the for tourists and you're there for a day. It, it's seven dollars. It's six euro for an all day pass. They run every six minutes and they run a very short distance. For instance, in our vernacular, it would run from St. Matthews to 9th Street and here down to Eastern Parkway. It's a T. You're not going to be able to get to outer loop, and it wasn't meant for that. It was meant to get in and out. Mm -hmm. The other thing it did, tourists love it. They stay at the hotel, maybe they're at the hotel out in Butcher Town, but they want to go gamble. They hop on the Lewis, boom, they're there. Those are just the types of things that this city has to get off the schneid and do. Otherwise, we're always going to be doing this. How come we're not like? We need to quit doing that and start saying, how come they're not like us? That's what we need to do. You want to draw residents in here. There's a whole east end of Louisville with a million 20-some-year-olds who are looking for places to live. They're not on that list. There's nothing on that list that says we're going to hold a forum out in, I don't know, St. Matthew's Mall or down Jefferson Mall. We're going to see what younger people would like to see downtown for residents. Yeah, we're, we're um, running out of time. I just wanted to ask two quick questions. 
Um, and there's really a way to start on that. Um, the first one is I think we have gotten a, a comment prior to the forum with someone who was interested in talking a little bit about waterfront park, which is obviously not really in the purview of, of what you're doing. Um, but I think a related question is, you know, I feel like the velvet space is highly underutilized. Um, is there any, you know, what, what's kind of the status of that space? I don't know how much of it is private for the city, um, but any thought process in, in this plan about revitalizing that? I think mean, beautiful space, but largely vacant outside of people going to park underneath it. Um, and my other second question was, you know, having watched administrations for the past, you know, 20 years struggle with bringing amenities downtown to make it easier to make it livable because they need people for the investment will come. What what is um you know what is there a different thinking behind how to make that residential part of this plan come to fruition that we've had the past? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. They're both good questions. So the, the first question about Waterfront Park and uh, Belvedere. So let's start with the Waterfront Park. So, so Waterfront Park is a great many, you know, it's it's beloved by everybody in the city. It really transformed the waterfront. Uh, all good things. However, it has, just as you said, it's always been somewhat isolated from downtown. Its connections have not been strong. And the, the western part of the, of the park, which is closer to downtown, uh, where the water feature is and the uh, waterfront office, uh, is to some extent the weakest part of, right by 64 and the park get over there. So uh, we've been uh, we've been working with the waterfront corporation, Beverly Bullet Street, on uh, looking at ways to better connect that part of the waterfront park to downtown. And that'll be that'll be part of the work that we're we'll doing in the next few months. Uh, also, there's there's, there continues to be a concern about uh, or a question about you know how can we get more more uh, services to people when they're at the waterfront restaurants bars you know food service those kind of things. So, uh, a lot of people look at Jeffersonville and say you know why can it be like that well it's it's different because the park is here uh, but we are looking at ways to active with them to activate activate the park more and get it closer connected to downtown which which is is, is a necessary thing to do. Uh, your concept of the Bellevue or the right on Bellevue has sort of always been a, to the dead end. It didn't really go anywhere. Uh, no one quite knew uh, what its purpose is. Uh, mayor understands that the mayor's put some money into his budget to uh, uh, look at ways to revitalize that and to better connect it to the Ali Center and the Museum Plaza side of the downtown. So we are, uh, we are looking, looking at that. Uh, the, the second concept that the residential labor is a little more complicated and we're, we're not quite sure what the answer is. So, you know, we've heard, we've, we hear from all the time for years, you know, uh, well, you know, once they have a grocery store downtown, people will move in. Well, not exactly, you know, uh, you know, you're, if you live downtown, you're, you're going to have a car. So on Saturday morning, you're going to go to Kroger and buy your toilet paper and whatever, you know, whether it's on Ninth Street or, you know, Holiday Man. But, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, having that urban market where you can go and get prepared food, fresh produce, some wine, where you know any given night you can do some market shopping as opposed to grocery shopping. Those are uh, in a lot of other cities where there's a more vibrant residential neighborhood feel. Those are more apparent, and we need to uh, uh, include those in mixed mixed use development permits as opposed to thinking think the thing here is that let's find a block and put a Kroger in and if we have to incentivize that Kroger let's do that that really doesn't work there's not a lot of good examples of that but there are really good examples of uh, uh, more residentially oriented markets that can be once you have significant number of, of, of doors residential you begin to include them and we're looking at some of the some of the Mixed use development options to see if that can be part of it. Um, thank you. I just want to thank everybody again for being here. I really want to thank Rebecca and Barry for joining us here. I look forward to being a part of the process as it continues. I hope maybe you know we'll get a little further down the road. You guys might be able to give us an update. And sure. I'm sure if anybody has specific things or questions they'd like to bring up, um, you know, it's pretty good. We're going to keep on this, but we don't want to take up too much of your time.
Thanks for being here and for your great comments and questions. Okay.